And we are really excited this evening to kick off our centennial year with this amazing event. As we thought about how to best start our centennial, we decided that the most important thing that we could do is to say thank you. And tonight we are going to say thank you to the many leaders that made Babson the institution that it is today. It is my great privilege to welcome this afternoon you to a program featuring our President Emeriti of Babson College, our current president, and our president-elect going into our next century. Representing our past, our present, and our future, you're in for a wonderful evening. Before we get started, I want to thank the many students that planned this event and our gala this evening for returning this event to the college and for everything that they've done and the student leaders. So thank you. Can we have a round of applause for our students, please? I'd also like to acknowledge that our, we have several former board chairs who are here with us this evening. Joe Wynn, Richard Snyder, Brian Barefoot, and Bill Markey, welcome. We're excited to have you. We have more than 46 years and nine generations of Babson leaders gathered here tonight. I'd like to now introduce President Carrie Healy, Babson's 13th president. Dr. Carrie Healy, no, no, I'm not done yet. I'm going to introduce, I'm going to say more. It's not, it, we're not that quick up here. Um, Dr. Healy took office as president of Babson College in July 2013, following nearly three decades of service in academia, government, humanitarian work, both in the United States and internationally. She is the first woman to hold this position at Babson College. Under Carrie's leadership, Babson has continued as a recognized global leader in entrepreneurship, consistently keeping our ranked number one position as the leading entrepreneurial school in undergraduate and the MBA program, and moved into the number one slot for international students. She created and launched Babson's prestigious Global Scholars Program, a full tuition need-based scholarship program for exceptional international students. In addition, she created the Babson Worldwide Connect that has continued to galvanize and bring together our global community of alumni, students, and family from around the world. She expanded our presence in online entrepreneurship courses to more than 1,000 students in 200 countries around the world. Since she took office, alumni participation globally has increased more than 100%. Carrie has presided over many Babson milestones, welcoming the most diverse and well-qualified students in Babson history, celebrating the historic successes of Babson athletics, of which there are many, and unprecedented steps in higher education access and affordability as we move into our next century. Under Carrie's leadership, it, we are also now preparing and have a wonderful centennial year ahead of us as we celebrate. To help us achieve this vision, you also might notice that the campus is starting to also look a little bit different these days. So please join me in welcoming President Carrie Healy. Thank you, very much. Thank you, Marla. It is wonderful to see this crowd here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are incredibly fortunate tonight to have five of Babson's Presidents Emeriti, all extraordinary icons of industry and academia joining us for this conversation. Over the last century, beginning with Roger Babson himself, the college has benefited from the wisdom and guidance of remarkable leaders. Each president, each with unique talents and interests, has helped shape our campus and our community. Together, we represent over 45 years of leadership at the helm of Babson, nearly half of the college's 100-year history. So this evening, as we mark the first of many centennial celebrations and commemorations, we celebrate our past and envision our future. So now please join me in welcoming to the stage the President's Emeriti.
What an extraordinary group. Um, and before we begin our introductions, unfortunately, I do have some sad news to share. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Sis Glavin, wife of former Babson President Bill Glavin, passed away. And Sis was a beloved member of the Babson community, both during President Glavin's leadership and, and well beyond. In 1997, our community recognized her with an honorary degree, and she delivered the commencement address to our graduating students that year. Um, Sis is also uh, a wonderful support for the college. She raised funds and helped design the beautiful Glavin Family Chapel here on campus, a very special place and a lasting tribute to both Sis uh, and her family. Please join me now in observing a moment of silence uh, in honor of Sis Glavin. Thank you. So I hope that you will continue to keep uh, Sis and the Glavin family, uh, and especially Bill, in, in your thoughts. Uh, as a result of this uh, sad news, Bill Glavin is with his family uh, and unable to join us this evening. But I'd like to say just a few words that I would have said about his presidency if he were sitting here with us because he was so important to our college and, I, and I'd like to feel that he's with us here this evening. Bill served as Babson's president from 1989 to 1997, following his role as vice chairman of Xerox Corporation. During his tenure, Bill increased the college's focus on attracting international students, and Babson moved from being a regional leader to being a global presence. He promoted and championed diversity among the student population, and during his presidency, Babson earned its first number one entrepreneurship ranking from US News and World Report. Bill built Babson's President Society into a fundraising juggernaut and was the first president to raise more than $100 million for the college. So it please join me in thanking Bill for his visionary leadership, and we hope to welcome him back to campus soon. And so now it's my honor to introduce five of Babson's past presidents and to kick off our fireside chat. First of all, on my far right-hand side, your left-hand side, we have Dr. Ralph Sorensen, known to many of you as Bud. Perhaps some of you got Bud's book today during the book, uh, the, uh, oh, the book signing. Oh, do you have a prop here? There you go. <laughs> available in the bookstore. There you go. So Bud came uh, to Babson in 1974 and served as Babson's seventh president until 1981, but helped define what Babson is today. During his tenure, the college pivoted to focus on entrepreneurship, a strategic decision that would distinguish Babson for decades to come, and I thank you for that. During his presidency, Babson became the first college in the United States to offer entrepreneurship as a major, and the undergraduate program received AACSB accreditation for the first time. Bud created the, academic, uh, the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs, established the first endowed professor of entrepreneurship, and launched the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. Under his leadership, Horn Library was built, new dormitories were erected, and the Babson Recreation Center, now the Boston Sports Club, was completed. He also successfully completed the college's first capital campaign. We are thrilled to welcome this visionary leader back to Babson this evening. Welcome, bud. Next to bud, we have Dr. William Dill, who is Babson's eighth president. Serving from 1981 to 1989, Bill arrived at Babson during a time of significant economic shifts in the world, and Babson's programs reflected the reality of this new global economy. Bill brought a new emphasis on undergraduate liberal arts and increased Babson's national and international profile via accreditation. 
identifying opportunities for corporate and e executive education, Bill oversaw the completion of the Executive Conference Center, which became home to Babson's executive education programs. We're grateful to Bill for his commitment to lifelong education, which today is emerging as the future for all universities. Bill, thank you for positioning us to remain competitive in our second century. Welcome. <laughs> Next to him, Mr. Leo Higdon, Jr. Welcome. Lee was Babson's 10th president following President Glavin and serving from 1997 to 2001. One of the most impactful initiatives of his presidency was the establishment of the Center for Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership, a hub of activity and programming supporting women-led entrepreneurship. The Cutler Center for Investments in Finance was also established and funded under Lee's leadership. And during his tenure, the Foundations of Management and Entrepreneurship or FME, became a requirement for the first time for all first-year students. Lee strengthened Babson's curriculum with a renewed emphasis on technology, practice-based learning, and entrepreneurship in a global context. Committed to diversity in the arts, he oversaw the opening of the Reynolds Campus Center and this beautiful theater and the Glavin Family Chapel. So thank you, Lee, for your commitment to women in business and for helping to transform Babson's campus for the future. Welcome back to Babson. Thank you. Mr. Brian Barefoot. Brian is a member of the class of 1966. He served as chair of Babson's Board of Trustees and was the first Babson alumnus to serve as president. He held the position from 2001 to 2008. A champion for diversity on campus, Brian welcomed ba Babson's first cohort of Posse Scholars, a program that continues to have an incredible impact on our campus community. During his presidency, Brian improved the quality of life on campus, strengthening our alumni network and partnering with leading global educational institutions. And under his leadership, Babson developed a long-term strategic and financial plan, expanded its entrepreneurial leadership, and developed its athletics program. And on behalf of our entire community, I'd like to thank Brian and his wife, Pam, for their recent gift of $2 million to support Babson Athletics and establish the Pamela P. and Brian M. Barefoot Athletics Director position. Thank you, Brian and Pam. And last but not least, my predecessor, Mr. Leonard Schlesinger, who is the 12th president of Babson. <laughs> Len served from 2008 to 2013. He established entrepreneurial thought in action and entrepreneurship of all kinds as the foundational elements of Babson's strategic positioning, expertise, and culture. Len felt it was vital to integrate social, environmental, economic responsibility and sustainability into the core of the curriculum and educational experience. His vision included building and supporting a generation of entrepreneurial leaders and creating a global consortium of entrepreneurship education to bring entrepreneurial thought and action to the world. The Schlesinger Innovation Center, a learning and collaboration space that is home to the FME program, is named in Len's honor and recognizes his unwavering commitment to the entrepreneurship education. Len, thank you for your inspiring leadership and for creating a strong foundation that will help lead Babson into our second century. We're delighted that you joined us tonight. Thank you. Now, as I transition into my role as moderator, I have to tell you that this is going to be very hard because presidents like to talk a lot. Did any, did any, can you imagine that? The presidents like to talk? So I have um, an aide with me, uh, which is a small gong. <laughs> And uh, you all have a clock before you, which no one else can see. And in the event 
which I'm sure this will not happen, one of you tends to go on a bit long, um, you might hear a sound. That's all I'm saying. So I, uh, I just wanted to say that as uh, setting the context, if you will, for our, our discussion. Because everyone wants to hear from all of you, and we're fascinated to know uh, what is exactly going on. So, um, so to set the stage for our conversation and to help us better understand the flow of Babson history, I'd like to start by asking each of you to briefly give us the context for your presidency. So what do you feel it was unique about Babson at the time of your presidency? And, and I'm going to start with Bud because uh, I'm going to try to get the flow of history coming in this direction. So we're going to start with Bud and fairly rapid fire answer if we can. <laughs> I well, see a pile of papers on your lap, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Okay. Well, first, I'd like to say what an incredible pleasure it is to see all of you, you here today and to be here with all my fellow Babson presidents. It's, a, it's really a true honor. And uh, ever since I came to Babson, I've had a sort of special feeling about it. And let me just give you very quickly uh, what I said in my inaugural speech there, I said I've, I've sensed a very special quality about the Babson community. The people who make up this community really seem to share a great love for and loyalty toward Babson. There's an esprit and an air of friendly, friendliness and a ring of laughter about the campus that I find totally refreshing. It is this shared of sense, esprit and love and loyalty that will be the single most important ingredient for the future progress and development of this college. And that, that's as true today as it was before. I see my role as having been uh, a little bit uh, like that of Johnny Appleseed. And uh, the idea was uh, that role involved planting some strategic institutional seeds that were subsequently cultivated and improved and implemented right up to the present day by all these gentlemen who are on the stage here today and Bill Glavin. And uh, it, so it's also, I want to say that everything that was done that, uh, while I was here, it was a team effort. We really worked together as a team and that was faculty and students and staff and uh, members of the governing boards and people from the business community and from Wellesley. And uh, in a moment, I'll talk a little bit, if I have another chance, Gary, about <laughs> you about uh, the most important seed that was planted, which was that of entrepreneurship. And uh, as this conversation goes on, I'll be happy to tell you how that all came out and why it was important. Thank you. Thank you, Bud. That was excellent. And, and I have to say, reading, uh, reading the history for, to, to prepare for tonight and honestly helping to uh, write and review the history of the college in preparation for our centennial, it struck me how much what you said is, is really true, that, that each of you uh, built on each other's legacies and enhanced it and expanded it in ways that really have just deepened uh, the culture of Babson. So, so thank you. So now, Bill, uh, what would you say was unique about your time, your moment at Babson? Well, let me start by commenting on what I found when I came here. Um, Babson, a few years before Bud arrived, and big part of what Bud and Walter Carpenter did, uh, wasn't really eligible for approval. The Association of Business Schools didn't recognize the validity of places that just offered a business degree and nothing else. So we were off on the side of the board. We couldn't apply for accreditation until Walter and Bud got that moving. Uh, and we'll say a little more about US News in a minute. But uh, when they came out, they didn't recognize, like as if they hadn't recognized there were weekly magazines, that there was a category that of one program of schools that shouldn't be recognized. And what I inherited was a place that had just won the battle on accreditation and just accomplished it. And it was a great accomplishment. 
And I felt coming in, I had some ideas what I'd like to do, but it was also a time where you really wanted to ask the community, what do you really want to have now that this is all going on? And there was lots happening. I came in off a spree and international assignments as my uh, academic dean did. Uh, and uh, I was very interested in the, the excitement of putting together liberal arts and business in an environment where they really could work together as equals. And it's a very rare thing still today to have it happen the way it does at Babson. So that was my thing. I talked, needed to talk to other people here about where they wanted to take the school, what kind of facilities we needed to add to to make that happen. And uh, the, the question here was to uh, get uh, as rapidly as we could to a focus. The one thing I would say was entrepreneurship, I'm going to annoy people here for a minute, really wasn't high on the list at the time. Bud and I talked. You couldn't avoid Jack Hornaday. Uh, and there were circles. I'd been through a battle uh, at NYU where we had a chance to get some money, which eventually came here to uh, Babson, and the faculty wasn't interested in going after it. But uh, the uh, I got a list of eight pages from the chair of the committee, search committee, of things that had been on people's minds, uh, little short statements uh, about what the new president should do. There were maybe half a dozen of these things, equivalent of a sizable paragraph that had anything to do with entrepreneurship. So we've come a long way in those years. and. Our year was, uh, my time was one of comparing these things and saying which are the directions we're going to try to go in. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So, Lee, tell me about what was Babson like when you arrived? What was the context? Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was at a point where I think the highlights for me, um, in part, Owen College uh, became a reality uh, during my time. and. You know, the land was bought, the buildings were built, uh, Rick Miller was appointed president, the faculty, and the, the, the early stages of collaboration between ourselves and Owen began. I think a common point for all of us has been uh, really Babson's focus on curriculum and innovation. And it was particularly intense during my time. You mentioned some of it in the undergraduate program uh, closer connections to the practice world, outcome orientations in the MBA program, you know, various entrepreneurship tracks that expanded um, and embedded the notion of entrepreneurship in, the, in graduate education. Uh, I think as well it was the onset of distance learning that took place uh, at that time. It was sort of in its infancy, but Babson, uh, you know, got into that. Uh, with Babson Interactive and Intel and a number of very important programs that I think, as, as Bud was talking about, sort of seeded the ground for other work. And uh, the last thing, which I, I think I'm particularly proud of, this building, the Sorensen Center, all of the things that broadened, pr pr provided for the opportunity to broaden students' perspectives, and importantly, the Women's Leadership Center. And, uh, and very proud of that. And to the last point that, that Bud made, it really was an effort of the whole community. And I was fortunate enough to have a great group of men and women that work with me. And, so and women you. entrepreneurs are one of our three centennial focuses Absolutely. now, one of our three areas Happy of special focus. So uh, very, very prescient. Wonderful. Thank so you. Brian, you, you came here at an economically very difficult time as president. But you'd been engaged for many years. Can you set the stage for your presidency? Shock. <laughs> and awe. <laughs> Not awe, shock. <laughs> now, you've got to think about this for a minute. I, as, as Carrie said, I graduated in 1966. I joined the board when Bill was president. 
I was uh, involved because I lived in, we lived in San Francisco at the time when Bud started his first capital campaign. I may have been the only alum living west of the Hudson or, or outside of Massachusetts. So I sort of got connected and I can remember meetings at Wiano when we were trying to figure out how to raise, I don't even remember the amount of money, but, but it wasn't a lot, but then it was a lot. Uh, but when I was asked to be, I was an interim president, and I said that's the good news for me and for everybody else, because I came, and much like Lee from Wall Street before he went to Darden, you come from the command and control world of business, and in particular Wall Street, mm -hmm. transaction oriented, a long time's tomorrow, till the next deal, into an environment, and even though I'd been around it for a long time and I had been chair of the board, I don't think until I got here, I appreciated the importance of process, uh, having to deal with multiple constituents, um, and on top of that, through no fault of anybody, the market sort of tanked, the tech bubble burst. Um, we had some real challenges. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't, and I think we dealt with them pretty well. It took us, of the seven years I was here, five years to actually get to gap positive. Uh, and so Len at least didn't have to deal with that. Some tough decisions were made, but if it weren't for people like Mike Fetters, who was the Dean of Faculty or Vice President for Academic Affairs, and while I was here we changed the title to Provost, Hank DeNault, um, Mary Rose. Who is still here, by the way, and who is Mary Rose. Mary Rose Mark, is Mark, still Mark, here. Mark Rice, who's, it's like Spinelli, you know. It's, the, yeah. it's, like, it's like old home week. Uh, Steve, Steve was, was head of the Blank Center and chair of the entrepreneurship division. Mark Rice came in when I did as dean for the graduate school, and it's like having the band back together again. Uh, but you know, what goes around comes around. But I think, I think that, uh, that the idea that some smart ass said when, uh, when I'd been here about a week that because the president's office was in the library, I'd already spent more time in the library than I did during my whole undergraduate career. You know, I was trying to get your grades for tonight. I was going to um, put them up on a screen, but I, I didn't. At any rate, but it, <laughs> we, we had a lot of fun, but it was a challenge. But that's what, you know, challenge presents opportunity. And I do think that, uh, you know, able to bring Posse in, I can remember the conversation like yesterday. Monica Inzer was the undergraduate admissions dean at the time. Melissa Shack ran uh, financial aid, and, I, and my young, youngest daughter, Molly, had been at Middlebury, and I was exposed to Posse through an unfortunate occurrence there where a couple of those young girls were killed in a car accident. And I thought we needed to be a little more diverse, perhaps, and these were kids. And so I said, we should look into this. And they spent the summer looking into it, came back and said, we can't afford it. And I said, we can't afford not to. So we're going to create 10 posse scholars. We're already spending the money, but we're going to designate whatever the amount of money was. In fact, that first year, we took 11, because we couldn't decide. They were all so many really attractive young young men and women from the New York City area, which is our affiliation with Posse. And I think that brought a dimension to campus that, that's made a big difference over the years. So, uh, Ab abs interesting. Absolutely, and you know, years later, I modeled the Global Scholars Program on the cohorts from, from Posse, because it had worked so well, and I knew that that was going to be a successful formula. So, so Len, what was it like here? It what great. did you find? Yeah. So uh, I think Brian tells the story very well about essentially what my inheritance was from him, which was we had stabilized the financial model for the institution. Uh, we were beginning to look at our international student body and our, our posse scholars as true assets to capitalize on. And uh, I was going to, and Brian thankfully kind of acknowledged it, it wasn't that Brian welcomed uh, posse to the campus. Brian brought posse to the campus. And uh, there are a few decisions, at least in the history of the school, that I think that had more impact on changing the nature of the community in very, very powerful ways. And we owe him a great deal of debt for that. The, um, my job was essentially to polish things. I mean, it really is. It, we, had this, we had this entrepreneurship reputation 
except I'd go around the campus and ask what it meant and kind of people didn't know. Uh, and uh, then I had trustees who were interviewing me when I was a candidate who were saying, uh, everybody else is doing it too now, so what do we do? Right? And so the answers for both of those were an opportunity to begin to define entrepreneurship more rigorously uh, and to uh, attempt to broaden its reach in a more compelling way. All rested on the notion of the fact that we had to build a more, uh, a more robust competitive model uh, to compete for students and to compete for resources. Um, and uh, while we were in the process of having all these conversations to get this started, uh, just like uh, Brian had the benefit of the tech meltdown, I just had the whole global economy go to hell. Uh, and uh, and uh, that tends to interrupt your plans. Um, and so we had to cope with yet another set of economic challenges at the institution. Um, but there's a set of themes that come from this, which is, you know, Bud brings us the logic of entrepreneurship. Uh, Bill brings us some measure of academic respectability. Um, Lee builds on the work that Glavin did and actually starts to cement it into buildings. Uh, Brian brings us a labor of love from a Babson grad that actually really grounds a lot of these issues. And I'm left with the opportunity to try and buff those in a variety of different ways and leave all this crap to you. <laughs> Thank goodness I don't have to answer this question. So, um, so, so Bud and, and Bill, um, let me ask you, I think all of us when we're here on campus, we, we have this idea of what our legacy might be or what we might be most proud of in retrospect. And I bet that changes over time. So when you look back on your time, let's start with Bud. When you look back at your time here, what, what makes you most proud? What gives you the most satisfaction? Well, as I said earlier, uh, the idea of, of planting some seeds that my successors really made flourish. And, and let me tell you uh, for a moment how this focus on entrepreneurship came to be. Uh, I came here from the, I'd been teaching at the Harvard Business School and there were some people on campus who were afraid that when I was, uh, arrived here I was trying to, I would try to Harvardize Babson and I never, this never crossed my mind. Uh, that would have been folly. But we decided <laughs> that uh, we really had to pick a niche. And how did we pick the niche of entrepreneurship? Well, it was, um, the first thing I did when I got here, I tried to immerse myself into learning as much as I could about the college, and that included looking what the alumni of the college was, were doing. And many of them, uh, it professionally, had president after their name, or CEO, or founder of, of small businesses, and that's when the light bulb uh, went, went off. And so uh, what we did was to say, and somebody mentioned uh, Jack Hornaday. He was t teaching a course in entrepreneurship. And at the Harvard Business School at that time, they had 106 courses, one of which was called Management of Small Businesses. They were training people to become uh, leaders in the, uh, the generals, General Motors, General Electric, or going to Wall Street, or going to McKinsey. But, so we had to, we had to figure out uh, this niche. And so entrepreneurship, why did we pick that? First, to build on the historic tradition at Babson. Second, there were no other business schools in America that had that specialty. Third, uh, the focus on entrepreneurship had a chance to win the support of all the faculty members because you needed good professors of finance and of marketing and operations and uh, strategy and so forth. Unlike in a lot of other schools, if you're at Wharton and you're in finance, it's great, but if you're not in finance and you're a faculty member, you're second class citizens. So uh, the other thing, however, when we were looking ahead at what was needed in America, it was clear that we needed innovation, uh, continuing uh, innovation, and, and uh, we needed people who were able to start creative new enterprises, uh, hence entrepreneurship. So uh, what we did, we opened a center for entrepreneurship and we offered courses in entrepreneurship, but we also led to the ultimate 
development of the uh, SEE program symposium for entrepreneurship educators. Now, I understand that there have been 8,000 people who have gone through that program who are teaching entrepreneurship all over the world. And that's one of the reasons why we continue to be ranked uh, number one in, in, in that whole area. Uh, we also started a research program in entrepreneurship, which we did initially in partnership with Stanford and uh, with uh, Oh Gong. <laughs> she she gongs and I'm gone. <laughs> we kind of knew, but yes, okay. So so Bill, when you look back on your legacy, what what are you most proud of? Well, I will endorse that he did all these things, and they, some of them continue really active stuff. The, on entrepreneurship, since there's so many advocates here, I believe in it, but I'm going to let other people really build it up. But I think one of the things that uh, happened as we went ahead doing this over the, uh, our two presidencies involved finding people who really could do it as faculty members. Because again, presidents don't do a heck of a lot to, to move certain things ahead. And it was getting, not beyond Jack, but getting people like Jeff Timmons and Bill Bygrave and you know, other people in to really take the lead. And the decision to move in with the help of the donor who was trying to sell entrepreneurship at Babson, who did sell it here, to create the Price Bell of the Christ Babson Fellows Program, which has brought in a whole bunch of people educated here, impressed with what we have, and great promoters of Babson in the world outside. It's a real promotional coup as educational. I'd like to say a word about uh, another one of the things Bud was stirring up that I actually remember you saying more about at the time was we ought to have an educational conference center here somehow. It was going to be an easy job. You know, we, we've got some faculty who do these programs. We'd like to do more. There's a market out here. If we could have a little facility that would house about 40 people and run courses, that would be great. And we looked at that for a while, and we finally decided to invest in a consultant to tell us what to do. We got some bad advice from them on some things, but they were very firm on one that other people confirmed. If you're going to do this, you've got to go whole bat. You've got, even though everybody else is talking about building these centers, you got to have a room for at least 120 people so you can support all the services and facilities that will make people glad they came here for the program. Gulp. Uh, wanted to do it. Great enthusiasm. But that now is a $13 million project. Uh, and as uh, Bill Crozier said, going into a meeting, one of the final meetings on this would go up and down the board meeting. Um, I'm going to vote for it, but I want you to remember this thing is 13 million bucks, 14, year, 15, 14 to 15 year payback period. Uh, you're going to rent it by the week. <laughs> but we got enough votes enough faith to really make it uh, go. Uh, and I think that was, it's made a mark here in a lot of other ways. The other thing I'm proud of was that I think, although I didn't see the fruits of it until just as I was leaving campus, that we finally got through, and I did a lot of various things with US News to get them to admit maybe we did exist and we were. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, bravo with that, yes. <laughs> And uh, yeah. if I, whoever put them up to creating a special column for entrepreneurship in the early years really helped Babson out tremendously. It, it worked. It's worked and it still is working. So congratulations. So, so Lee and Len, I'd like to ask you guys a slightly different question. It's one of the interesting things about all of us on stage is that we came from very different backgrounds, but none of us had been college presidents before we came to Babson. And so I'm sure we all had 
moments of surprise. Uh, I think Brian said shock, but I'm not asking Brian this question. But so, so Lee, what, what surprised you about coming here and that transition from uh, the business world to here? Yeah. So I think everybody who goes through, it's, it's sort of unknown um, to all of you. When you go through a presidential search process, you really steep yourself into the institution and try to get an assessment of you know, kind of what the institution is like, what are the issues, et cetera. And then you kind of get under the tent and you become an insider. And you're, you know, sometimes there are surprises. Sometimes those surprises are unpleasant. I would say in my case, they were on the positive side, very pleasant. And I think if I had to kind of pinpoint a number of things that I found out when I came here and spent some time in the Babson community, Number one, I knew that the institution was known for entrepreneurship. What I think I did not appreciate or realize was how entrepreneurship was really integrated and infused in all of our curriculum and programs. And indeed, it was um, like the typical entrepreneur. It was a way of thinking and behaving that really permeated the institution. I think the other thing that I was struck by was, um, and I mentioned this earlier, the, the, the ability to take what I would call prudent risks as it relates to the curriculum and the program. Um, the standard, the sort of good enough, if I could use that terminology, good enough was not the standard at Babson. Good enough was not the standard at Babson. And Babson always felt, the, the college felt, that there were ways to make the program better. And it wasn't afraid of making changes. And for those of us who've been in, in academic institutions or other academic institutions, that is very, very hard to do. And I think in part that that's another reason that I was surprised by, which is the collaboration that exists at Babson amongst the faculty, not only in the management education disciplines, but I would also say between management education and the liberal arts. And I think what that has produced is the success that the institution has, and not only in terms of entrepreneurship, but more broadly, in, and now in management education. I can recall, you know, we've, we've talked about US News. US News had a survey it was a survey of undergraduate education, and I think it was the first one to come out. We were the only uh, business college in that ranking, and we were ranked, I think, higher than you know, 40 or 50 percent of the institutions there. And all of the other institutions from top to bottom were household names. But because of, of who we were and how we competed, we were successful. And I think that's what I, I think a very pleasant surprise. Well, it must have been a pleasant surprise because you've continued on being a college president ever since. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, Len, what surprised you? My surprises are quite different. I had the benefit of being here for four months uh, while Brian remained president. And so when I started the presidency on July 1st, I didn't believe I had any profound surprises relative to the institution or its position. Every Friday, Brian and I sat down and he told me the truth. Uh, and and uh, it made it made that part I'm of the job. I'm doing the same thing for Steve. Yeah, yeah he, he really yeah, appreciates yeah, it. Yeah, and but the surprises you have aren't, in some respects, the, it's more of a confessional. So two weeks after I took over, um, Tina Fey was all over the internet, um, having said something like Babson Lacrosse blanks, uh, and uh, everybody was in an uproar. So, like, what are you going to do about that? Well, there's no training I ever had in my managerial or academic career that helped me to respond uh, to Tina Fey. And it's the summer, so it's hard to find someone to ask for advice. The, um, uh, so, it, figuring out that and then ultimately going to the bookstore and buying a Babson Lacrosse t-shirt uh, and inviting Tina Fey to have an honorary degree uh, and, and putting it all on social media, uh, and then continuing to push the issue, uh, I thought was kind of part of my job. Uh, the second part of my job, and, I, and maybe all of you will be lucky enough to never have this, 
is the week before what was called the admissions day, which was called basically Babson Day, uh, where all the parents come with all the admitted students to find out, and it's really an important decision day uh, for parents and their kids. The dean of the college comes running into a meeting that I'm doing to say, uh, we have a norovirus and we have to close. <laughs> I said, excuse me? We have a norovirus and we have to close. There are people throwing up all over the place, right? And other things. Uh, all orifices are being challenged. And, uh, and uh, if we don't get this under control today, <laughs> if we don't get this under control today, we will not be open by the time parents come. So can you imagine what it's like to have 350 parents and kids show up on an admissions day? So uh, it was an amazing opportunity for the community to come together to learn how to deal with the town of Wellesley, to le learn how to deal with the, the, uh, the state of Massachusetts, or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, and, uh, and then the only thing I saw uh, on TV every day uh, when they talked about the Norvice that had shut Babson College was the president of the college standing up and saying, wash, 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 flush, flush, flush. <laughs> Wash, wash, wash. So there's nothing in my career that prepared me for that. Third one, just quickly. Um, every president has to do a state of the college, right? It's the obligation. And I was going through my first state of the college talk, and I had the obligatory 75 uh, slides that, by and large, uh, I didn't enjoy putting together, and no one would enjoy hearing. Uh, but you have to do it, right? And, and I panicked the night before that this was going to actually be terrible. Uh, and, uh, and it probably would have been. And, uh, but I saw a, a, a blog post on my computer that night by a guy who had a, an entrepreneurial blog called Gaping Void uh, that highlighted a line about strategy that said, uh, don't try to be the best uh, when you can be the only. Right? So someone says, well, where did the Babson strategic positioning come from? It came from Jerry Garcia, the lead singer of The Grateful Dead. <laughs> Didn't come from Michael Porter, didn't come from any other academic textbook. And the notion of aligning a community emotionally around the notion of sharpening the definition about what it was all about so they could actually articulate the fact that there was no place like this anywhere else in the world really much, very much served as the foundation of uh, the work I got to do, and none of that was I prepared for. <laughs> We still live in fear of norovirus. People still invoke that, you know, constantly to me. Um, I have a few more months. I think I'm going to be okay. But so, Brian, you've been a student. You've been a trustee. You've been chairman of the board. You have been the president of the college. Do you think that there's something? You've seen our community from every different perspective. Is there something that unifies the Babson community? Is there something special here? that you think you could define? Uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, that's a, it's an interesting question. And um, the answer is obviously yes. Mm -hmm. And I think about um, when I first met Bud, and you know, he was, I don't know, 35, 36. And I'm thinking to myself, Harvard. How did some guy from Harvard end up as president of Babson? Because it was only 74, so it was five, six years earlier that Babson Institute that I graduated from with no women, there are plenty around the area, by the way, <laughs> um, became Babson College and admitted its first class of women, I think 1968, if I'm about right. But I think Bud set the tone, and out of the chute, he gave the college something to latch onto. As we were transitioning from this quote unquote trade school where, you know, wealthy businessmen set their sons to come back and take over the family business. And all of a sudden, we had the opportunity to become relevant. Now, I don't know that we realized it at the time. In fact, I'm sure we didn't. And so all of a sudden, we had, a, a, we had the opportunity to create credibility in the academic world. Bill comes along from NYU. As he has been mentioned, he integrated liberal arts. 
all of a sudden we were almost like a real college. <laughs> we, besides marketing and finance, we had ologies, psychology, <laughs> sociology. I can go on, no biology, but uh, maybe that's next, Kerry. Or Spinelli can bring biology in if he'd like. You know, Bill's not here, and maybe I'll take a little bit of the time that he would have used to, from, this is. <laughs> but I, as, as an alum of the school, I don't think people realize the contribution that Bill Glavin made. He, um, first of all, he's 6'6", six, six, so you knew he was around. He was very affable, except when the door was closed. But he was a marketing guy. And he took these, these, uh, these good genes that had been harvested, grown by Bud and Bill, and gave us the academic credentials. But I think, certainly I'll speak for my generation, we weren't out there pounding our chest saying we are graduates of Babson College. In fact, I would tell you that many of my friends were almost embarrassed because you go to Wall Street or you go to McKenzie or wherever you go, and you're Harvard, Yale, Williams, all these places. Of course, none of them could get into Babson, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Bill gave this college a sense of self-confidence. He was so good at marketing. He was so good, and his partner, Alan Cohen, is not to be dismissed in terms of a critical leader as Bill's academic partner, much like I had Mike Fetters, at giving the college a sense of really belonging, that we were really good. We didn't know how good we were. And the other thing that Bill did, I can remember sitting around the dining room table, I'm on the board at the president's house. Larry Milas was a trustee at the time, and I'm looking out in front here, Betsy Powell sitting here, and some of you were, were involved in those days. Larry Milas was chairman of the foundation, the Olin Foundation. He was a Babson alum. He was actually a trustee. I'm not sure he was a trustee when these conversations started. He'd, he'd given money for the Horn Library. Right. He'd build buildings at Bates College all over, all over New England, uh, Wash U and St. Louis. And he came and, and he sat down and he said, look, he said, engineering in the, in the United States is falling behind. We've got to do something. The foundation board has sent me on a mission to explore if we're going to disband the foundation, what do we do with the time? And I can't remember, maybe it's 400 million, something yeah, in, that in, that, in that neighborhood. And we have two choices. One choice is to start from scratch. And if we were to do that, would Babson be willing to work with us? Would Babson be willing to sell us the land? I'm not even sure we got that detail. The answer was yes. And Lee referenced the fact that he, had, he inherited this thing that, that gave birth as soon as he arrived. The other choice was to go around and try and redo the curriculum at existing engineering schools. Fast forward, all of a sudden, we're presented with the opportunity. They want to invest here. And by the way, I find out after the fact, we live in Vero Beach, Florida. In the winter, up the road is Florida Institute of Technology. They were the runner up. Had, they, had the foundation chosen to try and re-engineer an engineering school, that's who they would have chosen. And as finishing in second place, they gave Florida Institute $50 million, which they used to build buildings. And if you go around Melbourne, Florida, not that there's a reason to go there, <laughs> because it's between Vero Beach and Disneyland, but if you were to go at Disney World, um, you would see Olin, you'd see Horn, some of the names that we see on a lot of these campuses. So I, I you know, I rather than talk, I'd rather talk about Bill and use some of his time because I don't think people. You, you've actually used all of his time now, so you, you've, you've done both. But he, but he, he was so instrumental in taking what those gentlemen had created from an academic standpoint and beginning to develop an identity that the rest of us really inherited. So, so I think that's really important to understand. Right. Well, thank you. <laughs> so going back to Bud and then asking all of you, um, let's start 
we've been talking about the past. Let's talk a little bit about our present. Uh, so you are all acute observers of the uh, academic landscape and of Babson. What would you say our current challenges are and what our current opportunities are? And uh, you know, just a, a quick minute on our challenges and a quick minute on our opportunities. What do you think, bud? Well, you can read about it in my book. <laughs> It's available at the bookstore. <laughs> Chapter 27 is called uh, The um, Future of Higher Education. And uh, seriously, for a moment, uh, Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School developed the concept of, uh, of uh, disruptive technologies or innovation. And I think higher education is going to be the next major target of disruptive technology. Clayton Christensen talks about the reason for that being the advent of uh, MOOCs, uh, massively online uh, open classrooms, uh, and um, online teaching, and that sort of thing. I think there are other reasons, though, that higher education is at risk. Uh, first of all, tuitions have gone out of sight, and kids are graduating with uh, with uh, uh, enormous debt loads. Uh, secondly, uh, the educational facilities are among the worst, least efficiently used of any industry. I mean, think of it. Most colleges and universities have, uh, are only uh, open eight months a year, or eight and a half months, or whatever it is, and that has to do with their classrooms, uh, which are used four or five hours a day. And uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, a problem. Uh, then there is the institution of, in my view, of tenure. Tenure leads to some rigidities it was, uh, that was developed in um, 1910 when uh, Harvard, uh, University of Chicago, and um, uh, I believe it was um, NYU, uh, Columbia University, they adopted tenure. The idea was to have free, free speech uh, protected. Those protections are, are not needed as much uh, today. But what happens is uh, tenured professors, when they go on a tenure track, they spend their first seven to nine years focusing on publisher parish. And they have their research opportunities, they have their their uh, teaching burden. So, so, and as a result, so are there opportunities? Let's, so lots of challenges. Let's, let's try to be positive here. Though. Are there opportunities for us? What, well, what I we... think that we need to be uh, concentrate on the challenges. Okay. Uh, I think they're... <laughs> okay, but, that works. But let, me, that let, works. Me say a, let me say a brief word ab uh, about opportunities. The idea of formal education is something that starts in kindergarten and ends with a degree uh, either in a uh, uh, high school degree or a college degree, and then it's all over, is so yesteryear. We have to become lifelong learners. And I think our biggest opportunity going forward has to do with executive education. Uh, with We've got our conference center and so forth. But I think all of us as human beings in, in this world we're living with, with the advent of, of new technology and artificial intelligence and so forth, we have to become lifelong learners. Which I is think a everybody great segue in this to Bill, who is a lifelong learner. Bill, you're not a lifelong learner. Do you want to start by saying a little bit about that, but then go to challenges and opportunities? Well, the... In wandering around after Babson, I've had the pleasure of hitting up other kinds of institutions on an interim basis. So I've seen the challenge from the standpoint of what nuns usually oversaw at a small Catholic liberal arts college. And running education from that perspective, I've had a delightful year down at the Boston Architectural Center, which is a... In, like Babson, a maverick in its, its field, which is finding its way doing architecture and some very interesting approaches. And then uh, years as a trustee and uh, interim president at uh, Maine College of Art, which 
gets over on the, the other end of liberal arts in terms of uh, the performance and the an area where one of the things students need is what they now call up the artist at work program, which we help develop, which is a large dose of entrepreneurship at the personal level in terms of their performances. But I'd like I'd like to highlight just a couple of things. I think the where Babson is poised, looking at all the educational issues we have in the world, one of the real strengths of this place is its international history, its international links, uh, its alumni, uh, on all the areas where we're trying to find ways to put countries together uh, politically, economically, organizationally to solve problems that come with all of us. I think Babson has an exceptional role to play here. I can't define it in particular, but we have a base for being a force in international influence in education, which has been associated with the Columbias and the Harvards and the other that uh, is interesting to approach. And the other, and I didn't bring this apparatus to uh, sort of show off, but uh, as we age, and I live among the aging in a very nice retirement committee, community and uh, know a little bit of North Hill and other places. Um, and as I look around at the people we have in our retirement community who've been executives, professionals at very high level, scientists in the medical healthcare communities, there are some tremendous opportunities to apply what we think we know about working through problems of organization and management and entrepreneurship, cost containment, and other things with people from these backgrounds. And uh, I think Babson uh, is behind the curve with some other institutions in the area. This is a wonderful city in which to build these links and putting something together with the medical and healthcare that's right. Yeah, we do have a great opportunity ahead of us there. And, and Lee, let's talk about opportunities. What opportunities do you see for Babson moving forward? Well, I, um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, the situation that corporations find themselves today, and I, I think the difficulties they're having, I think, spell opportunities for Babson. And let me explain why I feel that way. You know, if you're, you're a corporation today, the vast, vast majority of industries are characterized as a degree of instability right now. There's never been greater change than, than, exists, uh, than exists today. If your business model is not under attack, and think financial services and fintechs, uh, just but one example, you're having to worry about how it's going to happen. Uh, and, I, and I think that from the from the perspective that I have, um, what corporations corporations are trying to do is put in, you know, they're trying to sort of address this issue in a number of different ways. And we've all sort of read or heard about, you know, artificial intelligence and data analytics and all of the things. The real essence of it is a is a change program, and trying to align from from up from back to front between you know, culture, processes, and practices, and most importantly, the talent strategy, and aligning the talent with the mission and the vision of an institution. I think this is where Babson wins. I think this is where Babson wins. So why do I say that? I say that because number one, the curriculum is relevant and rigorous. We've been talking about curriculum innovation tonight. Number two, we have faculty that are master teachers, and they deal with real practitioner problems. And that produces graduates that I think are very much in tune with what corporations look at. And at a global level, I think this is what it counts in terms of, of finding uh, you know, the right kinds of positions for our graduates. I think they are team oriented. They uh, essentially um, recognize and seize on opportunities. That's the essence of entrepreneurship. Uh, I think they have entrepreneurial drive. Uh, and I think to Bud's point, and I think it's a real good one, they are 
lifelong learners because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, the only competitive advantage that you know you have in the corporate world is your ability to learn at a quicker pace than your competitors and apply it. So I'm relatively optimistic about about Babson, and I think we've also got on our faculty thought leaders who I think are very much in tune with what corporations want today. So, so Brian, I saw you backstage talking to President-elect Spinelli. What kind of opportunities were you advising him to pursue? First of all, you don't give Steve any direction because he won't, <laughs> he won't take it because he's an entrepreneur, you know. He's, um, the world we live in today is challenging. Uh, the geopolitical environment is unpredictable. Uh, watch television, it doesn't matter what channel you watch, the government seems to be knocking at our door. Um, the, um, the affordability of education is a challenge for everybody. If you don't have a huge endowment, it's difficult. But out of those challenges becomes the opportunity, and I think the word that I always associate with entrepreneurship is leadership. And entrepreneurship, I was talking to Len earlier, I mean, I give Len a lot of credit because he took this word called entrepreneurship, which I thought was a French wine back in 1978. <laughs> but he put some context, thought and action. Those words matter. I'd like to see the opportunity for us is to, is to maybe work leadership into the, not that it's, it's a given, but it's not, it's not as out front as I think it should be, and you just look around. You know, we all take leadership for granted until it's not there. And then you begin to realize how important leadership is. I think the opportunity for us, and we can get into a debate whether leaders are born or made. Uh, I would argue that they are made and developed through a series of exposures and actions. And I think if there's a way and I would disagree with anything that anybody else said, to, to really put a focus on leadership, you think about the military. They've been challenged for 100, 200 years on defining, there's probably been more books, not yours, but, but <laughs> real thoughtful books, <laughs> that have tried to define leadership. <laughs> that was a compliment, I'm giving them a pitch. At any rate, I think the, 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 what we teach our kids here, if they can develop into the leaders that the world needs, will be a major, major contribution. Thank you. So, Len, if you were still president. Yeah, I'll try to, try to be more micro and orientation. Okay. Right. I mean, this was the best job I ever had. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about the institution. Uh, and think about the institution today and had the opportunity to talk to Steve a few weeks ago, just 17 days into having been acknowledged to be the next president. And, uh, and I think he's in for a, an enormously wild ride and an interesting one. Um, a large part of the work that Brian highlighted when he was talking about Bill Gladden and stuff like that was to build reputational capital for the institution. And I think anything you can see here from all of the presidents through you as well has been that we really have, we play in a different field, okay? Uh, we're, we have different competitors, we have a different cohort, uh, we are in the, you know, from an admissions perspective, we are an elite higher educational institution. What you see on this campus, okay, is $160 million of construction that are an absolute necessity for being able to continue to compete in elite higher education. Now, Bud says, well, we're gonna get disrupted by MOOCs. The reality is I'm not worried about the future of the 156 institutions that are elite being disrupted by, uh, by an online course. Uh, they are here, uh, they need to continue to be pressured to deliver extraordinary value to our students. Uh, historically, that has been defined here only on the ability to be able to demonstrate a, a job at graduation and income at 10, 15, and 20 years. I think we have a broader obligation to assist our students uh, in delivering lines of uh, lives with a broader purpose than just economic wealth creation. The second is that the cost of being able to do this leads to an economic model for these schools uh, that are, it's really crazy. Because at the same time, building on Brian's work relative to posse and, uh, and the intentional diversity of the student body and the community on this campus, 
it, the issues of being able to accommodate socioeconomic differences in being able to build a student body uh, is an extraordinary challenge that nobody other than the super wealthy uh, institutions that have endowments that rival the GDP of most countries in the world um, has been able to pull off. So I believe for the school to continue to be able to compete in the marketplace to get the best students to work with the best faculty in the best facilities to have the best outcomes, that model among the elites continues to get more and more expensive uh, and an increasing amount of the burden to be able to deliver on that expense structure will be dependent on, uh, on philanthropy. Uh, that, and so the ability, if you think you've been asked for money so far, <laughs> you have absolutely no idea. Uh, and, and, and because, because wearing a Babson sweatshirt should mean something now, okay? Uh, and as opposed to you hiding it, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it really should. So that's, the, that's really very much the second piece. It's expensive. Uh, we need to account for being able to manage the socioeconomic issues. The third piece, 30 seconds. Bill Gates a year and a half ago talked about the five most important trends in the world. Now, you know, he's a reasonably smart guy. <laughs> and we talked about some of them here. Uh, AI and machine learning, okay? Uh, a big issue. Biotechnology, a big issue. Um, uh, changes in aging, a big issue. Climate change a big issue. Those issues, the knowledge explosion in those areas are so fast. The question of being able to build an intellectual capacity in an academic community that can be relevant, okay, that can be relevant and can be useful, because Babson's great value is in being useful beyond being relevant, um, is a challenge like we've never seen before. Gap accounting gets four new rules a year, okay? It doesn't matter. Okay, uh, but these areas, the amount of explosion in knowledge really puts an enormous challenge on the academic side of this institution uh, to deliver on that promise. They're all upsides because we're starting from an enormous position of strength, but they are real amounts of work to be done. Thank you. I'm going to get back to you later and ask you what you meant about that accounting comment. But that's it. Um, so for our final lightning round, uh, one minute each. Uh, we collectively have overseen the graduation of some 38,000 students. Uh, so we have attended innumerable graduations, commencements, heard a lot of commencement speakers. What is the advice that you would give to Babson students? One minute. Okay. President Sorensen. <laughs> So I gave you. It's right there. Yeah, you you've can already it. taken five seconds. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> whatever you choose to do, do it to the best of your ability and strive to make something beautiful of it. Second, use your creative talents to make a positive difference. Third, the collective creative power of the team is far greater than that of any team member. Develop generosity toward others and be mindful of their needs. Work to live, don't live to work. If you don't enjoy your work, find work that you do enjoy. Be, bring an innovative entrepreneurial mindset to everything you do. Be awestruck by the extraordinary beauty and diversity of nature and do your bit to preserve it. Never lose your curiosity or your passion for learning loving and laughing. Try to live with a happy heart and optimistic view toward life. Excellent. Thank you. Mm, yeah, not anymore. <laughs> Bill. I never could live by that long list of rules. But, uh, <laughs> but there's a lot there that I would endorse. You know, I sweated on this more than any other question. Um, the answer is, you have no idea what's going to lie immediately beyond graduation, much less umpteen years afterwards. And relax and look around, try things, go with it. 
take a chance. Uh, we talked about jobs, we talked about careers. I don't know how many careers people I'm living with now have had over their lifetimes. How many times we find ourselves in completely different areas. Uh, the world is changing, there are lots of opportunities to change it. Get out and find something, do it and do it well, and uh, have some fun making a difference. Thank you, Adele. So this is really hard to, because it's the, sort of the one piece of advice, but I'll take a go at it. I, I really, and it connects to an earlier comment uh, that Brian made about leadership, and that is for strive for uh, a higher level of self-awareness. Um, know your values, know what you stand for. Uh, and above all else, know what you're about, because I think it's so important to professional success and personal happiness. Thank you. Brian, you've got some extra time. <laughs> what would Bill say? No, nobody listens to him anyway, so. You know, it, it, is, a, it is a hard question, and the, the one quality I think at the end of the day, particularly when you're starting out, and I, maybe I, it's some self-reflection, you tend to take yourself way too seriously. Um, the self-awareness is, is, is really important, uh, even today at, at my young age. Um, maintain a sense of humor. But the one thing, you know, my, my father, and I'm looking at my grandchildren sitting down here, and they, they've got their iPads, so you're probably playing some video game. <laughs> But, um, you know, my father got smarter as I got older, which I guess that that's how these things work. But he used to have a, a saying, and I've sort of expanded it, and it's mathematics. Two and two and one, and you're, you're set up for a good, good life. You have two eyes, you have two ears, and you have one mouth. If you observe and listen before you speak, you're, you're one step on your way to success. I'll leave it there. Excellent. Thank you. Len, words of wisdom? Yeah, I have a good friend, Bob Waldinger, who is a, a psychiatrist and a shaman, and um, uh, who har runs the Harvard Development Study that's been tracking alumni over now 55 years, 75 years, sorry. Uh, and uh, he was having dinner with me one night and talking about how it was hard to get people to pay attention to the messages that, uh, that come from that study about the people that had a long and healthy life. The messages, quite simply, are really very simple. Have friends and family. Okay? Uh, and so he went and did a TED Talk all right, uh, about having friends and family and how that provides empirical support for the essential preconditions for a long and happy life. And in the first three weeks, 15 million people uh, viewed it. Okay? Uh, and so you sit back and say, huh, well, maybe it needs to be said. Okay? So one of the inventions is in the, in the quest for being somebody or doing somebody or excelling in all you do, understand at the core uh, that without a foundation of friends and family is absolutely meaningless. That's number one. Number two is I'll go back to what I said that first uh, strategy night uh, on the state of the college, which is you have an opportunity in this world uh, uh, to differentiate yourself to the ultimate extreme by being the only, okay? And figure out what being the only means for each of you. It will be different. Don't look to your left, don't look to your right, Figure out what it means for you to be the only. Well, I want to thank all of you, uh, not only for being here with us tonight and for sharing your reflections, but also for the extraordinary contributions you have all made to Babson. This institution would not be what it is today, which is an extraordinary community filled with friends and family uh, without uh, your sacrifices, your vision, and your hard work. So if you, everyone could please give our presidents a round of applause. Yeah, thank you.
Our presidents are saying they used to get standing ovations from their faculty all the time. I don't, I don't know, that, that tradition hasn't endured. I'm not sure. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome Chairman, uh, Chair Compo uh, Capozzi back to the stage right now. Uh, she has a special announcement. Thank you, and thank you everyone. I learned so much listening to this conversation about our history and uh, where we might go. Thank you, President Healy, for a great discussion. Um, President Healy um, wanted to commemorate our presidents and this evening and also the history of Babson as we go into our next centennial. So in anticipation of this, we would like to announce our presidential portraits. Can you please turn? will be at the gala later this evening, um, but what a great way to commemorate our history and go into our future. Thank you again, and I'm going to, we'll have everyone come off the stage, and I'm going to do an introduction of President-elect Dr. Spinelli. Thank you. Now that we've heard from our past presidents, let me take this opportunity to introduce our next president, the 14th president of Babson College. If you'd like to clap now, you can already. So it is my pleasure to announce and introduce uh, President-elect Stephen Spinelli. Dr. Spinelli is an MBA from 1992. He is a lifelong entrepreneur founder of Jiffy Lube. He has spent his career at the intersection we're of academia. We're a team. Oh, okay. Um, do you want to make sure I say everything properly? Yeah, that's good. Okay, all right. Good. Good. I'm, I'm right here. You can follow, I like it. If you want to follow along. All right. <laughs> Business and philanthropy, co-founder of Jiffy Lube and was chairman of the CEO, chairman and CEO of American Oil Change Corporation. Dr. Spinelli spent 14 years at Babson as a faculty member, vice provost of entrepreneurship and global management, and director of the Blank Center. He led the charge to maintain Babson's number one entrepreneurship ranking and to achieve its first number one ranking from the Financial Times. In 2011, he was inducted into Babson's Alumni Entrepreneurial Hall of Fame. In 2007, he became president of Philadelphia University, where he established the Canbar College of Design, Engineering, and Commerce, a pioneering college of the transdisciplinary education. He led the merger of Philadelphia University and Thomas Jefferson University, unique in higher education, and was named the chancellor of the New Jefferson in 2017. Dr. Spinelli has co-authored eight books, and his work has appeared in many prestigious journals and the popular press. He speaks at conferences and universities around the world, has consulted for leading enterprise, and serves on the board of Planet Fitness. If anyone wants a gym membership, see him after the session. He earned his PhD in economics from the management school, Imperial College, University of London, his MBA from Babson College, a BA in economics from McDaniel College, and an honorary degree of letters as well in Ireland. Please join me in welcoming Steve back to Babson as our 14th president. Steve and Macho. I'll sit over here. Um, so as we conclude, we wanted to continue our... Do, does that mean my time is up? <laughs> Jeez, Fred. Fred. Turn off your phone. Turn off your phone? Um, so as we conclude, um, we wanted to spend a few minutes talking with Carrie, who just led the panel, and everyone having an introduction to Steve. To, uh, have an introduction to Steve. So Carrie, I'm going to start with you. Um, in your introduction, we talked a lot about the global nature of the college and the things that you have done. We'd love to hear a little bit more about how you think many of those programs, the Global Scholar, Babson Worldwide Connect, and what we need to do to continue that into our next century. So, so what a thank you, Marla. And by the way, it was so fun 
so fun talking to the president. <laughs> it's going to take me a long time to recover from that. I can't um, believe so you didn't use the gong more than you did. I said. used it. I, you're right. I didn't use it as much as I could have, so I apologize for that. Um, but so, so when I came here, what struck me was the diversity of our student body and also how, when you asked me, uh, you and the other trustees asked me to try to re-engage our alumni, those alumni were in 114 countries around the world. And there were 40,000 of them. And I, initially I thought, oh, I can just go out and, and, and visit our alumni associations around the world. There would have been no no way I could have completed that task. And so we really had to start thinking about how do we be a global college? How do we touch as many people as possible? How do we re-engage those alumni if, if I can't actually go to all of them? And so one way that I, I thought was really important was founding Babson Connect Worldwide, which gave a conference that could move from continent to continent and really highlight the, the wonderful entrepreneurs in that area and allow our alumni to come and meet them and, and get to know them and also to showcase the entrepreneurial ventures that they were doing. And so we've, we've moved that from Cartagena to Dubai to Thailand, back to Spain, and then uh, for our centennial, it's going to be right here at Babson uh, and in Boston in September. Um, I think that that has really galvanized this uh, this global vision, and it's also created what Len was was talking about earlier, which was a sense of family, which is a sense of belonging for right. the entire yeah. Babson community. And when you bring that Babson name and you bring the most outstanding entrepreneurs in any region together under that Babson flag, it has just elevated us internationally. And so I think that that's, that's a really important part of what we've been trying to do over the last few years, and I think it's working. It's a great transition. So now you come into a wonderful legacy of this. Um, Dr. Spinelli is our first experienced college president who will be our president. So, and also an entrepreneur, many, we have many entrepreneurs, but we are super excited about that as well and his experience. So Steve, talk a little bit about, you know, you've been a president for 10 years in a time of a lot of disruption and now you get to come back to Babson who has a fabulous foundation into its future. Why are you excited to come back? Well, Why are you here? <laughs> My wife asked me that. It, it, it is, uh, frankly, a nearly emotional experience coming back. It's just such a fabulous place. And, and the students, the real reason you come back to Babson is because of the students. They, they really believe they're going to change the world. And it's so much fun to be part of that and to be around it. I, I remember very distinctly, I'm bragging here for a minute. Uh, J who, who knows Jamie Simonoff? If you don't know, he did Ring.com, and he was in my class. And so I take credit for, for that, <laughs> and, and, and I remind him of that all the time. And uh, he called me about seven or eight years ago, and he said, I have this terrific idea. I'm going to do a video doorbell. And I said, okay, tell me about it. He told me about it, and he said, I want you to invest. And I said, it's a lousy idea. <laughs> I said, you don't have a special technology. There's no recurring revenue. You don't understand the channel of distribution. You're underfunded. OK, I'll send you the money. <laughs> and I said, but when you fail, don't let it affect our friendship. So seven years later, he calls up. He said, I just left Jeff Bezos. I said, oh, this is good news. I can tell. I can tell. And he said, I sold it for $1.3 billion. And I said, I told you it was a great idea. <laughs> And it, it is, but that is the, that's a, it, the zeros are pretty big with, with uh, Jamie, but that's a typical Babson kid, that they just say, I understand, and I understand the disruption, and I understand what chaos means, and I know how to navigate through that. And we have this amazing ability to bring people in this chaotic situation and for them to find the good. It's just terrific learning that happens here. I am really stunned, I'm reminded, we've always been a good, a place with good teaching. I think that's been a legacy of Baptist for a very long time. But I've been stunned at in coming back here, and what I've really learned about the quality of this institution is that it's, it's more than just the teaching. 
the amount of research that our faculty are doing and their ability to translate that research into market-facing information that then gets taught in the classroom is nearly remarkable. It is a stunning competitive advantage in a marketplace that needs that translation because it's changing so rapidly. If we can continue to do that, if we can scale that, if we can be nimble at scale with those kinds of skills, I think we change higher education. That's great. So Carrie, um, you know, Roger Babson, as many of you know, founded the college, believing that uh, business should be rendered in service of humanity. And Carrie, I've heard you mention many times that the world needs what Babson has to offer more than ever today, in the same way that Roger Babson founded the college. Say a bit about how you'd like to see that extend into the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, again, in terms of what you were just talking about, in, in terms of trying to connect what we're teaching and learning here to the real world and then taking that experience and bringing it back into the classroom, um, there are so many countries around the world who have too many young people without jobs. And many of them think that the government needs to give them a job or they're unemployable. And what we can do here is we can teach them that they can take their own ideas, that they can create their own businesses, that they can control their own fate, that they don't have to be dependent on a government, they don't have to be dependent on a business. They can learn from that applied experience in the, in the classroom that you're describing, Steve, and, and have the, the confidence to create something of their own and to have the sense that they'll never be, for example, starting a business for the first time, because everybody here starts a business in their first year. So they'll have that confidence. And that's what you don't see in young people around the world right now. You don't often see that sense that I can control my own destiny, I can make something, I can be Jamie Siminoff, right? So, that's, that's what I think that, that we, we give our students, and that's something we can give to the world and give to young people around the world that hope that they can control their destiny and make their own way. Awesome. So let's sit here, imagine it's five years from now, and we're sitting here talking to you. What do you want us to say? What do you hope to be able to say five years from now? We love you, Steve. <laughs> And we, we want to... <laughs> you're, you're still alive. <laughs> God, you were good at your job. You know, what, what, I, what I think we'll be talking about in five years is that this generation of, of eager young people are really built for networking. The, the issue of social networks have turned into economic networks, and we've never connected that with learning networks. So. The natural evolution, and I think the needs of, of everyone, but especially younger people who are really attuned to being a part of a network, is to, do, uh, to be Babson, for Babson to be, the center of, a, of an educational network that really is the nuclear core of a collaboration that can provide the kind of lifelong learning that the panel talked about earlier. And, and with entrepreneurship as such a, a collaborative endeavor, Babson has, as all those presidents said, and it was wonderful to hear them talk about the building of a culture of collaboration. Collaboration really does uh, empower diversity to be uh, positive. D diversity comes from the word divide. So we're in divisions, and most academic divisions don't know how to talk to each other. Here it's a natural part of the phenomenon. It's a natural part of the culture, and our students are just absorbing it. If we can do that in a more three-dimensional ecosystem, in five years you're going to say, Babson really is worldwide. That vision that those five or six presidents had uh, that were sitting on this stage has become a reality. That's what I hope you're asking about. Awesome. So last question. You get to inscribe a boulder for the next century. What do you put on it, Carrie? I'm actually from the North Shore of Boston, and so the idea, I'd, I'd like my boulder, please, to be in Dogtown Common. That would be really wonderful. The, the, <laughs> the, the story about Roger Babson and his boulders, how many of you know about the Babson boulders? 
So, so Roger Babson, during the Great Depression, wanted to support the, the poor stonemasons in his community who were out of work, but he didn't want to just give them money because he believed in the dignity of work. And so instead, he sent them into the cold woods to carve strange phrases on big rocks. And, and the meanest phrase that he asked anyone to carve was, get a job. And can you imagine being that unemployed stone worker in the woods carving, get a job? It's, it's devastating. So, uh, I'm what, guessing you're not going to put that on your book. No, I will not put that on my <laughs> stone. I, I would say uh, lead with humility because leadership is humbling. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. And I think it's very important to anticipate that and embrace it. Because if you do embrace it, as they teach here at Babson, then failure can be this wonderfully edifying experience and you can pivot and do the right thing and, and do better next time and become a real leader over time. You can pretend to be a leader, but you have to fail and then you become a real leader. So I think lead with humility. Steve? Uh, entrepreneurship will set you free. <laughs> Good one. Good one. It's a long word, it's a direct point. <laughs> I think we're gonna have to hire a couple people to do that yes, one, but sir. that's okay. Um, thank you again, I wanna thank Carrie and Steve for joining us up here, giving you a little bit of a window into the future and you will have many more opportunities as well. So thank you very much and we're gonna ask our presidents to come back for some pictures and head off to our, uh, the rest of our evening and our gala. That's thank right. you very much everyone.